Welcome to Manifest, hosted by international evangelist, teacher, and author Perry Stone. On today's program, you will experience a powerful right now word that will change your life forever. Enjoy unique insight into prophetic and practical truth as Perry ministers using biblical word studies, ancient Jewish history, and Hebrew customs that will cause the scriptures to come alive as never before. It's time to feast on fresh manna, so get ready to be blessed and encouraged. And now, here is your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Have you ever met anybody who says, I just don't believe in this teaching called the rapture? Well, on today's program, we're continuing part two of our series that I'm going to be explaining to you in detail the pre-tribulation rapture theory. Where did it come from? Where did it originate? Is there any evidence for it in Scripture? Now, last week, I hope you caught the program. If you didn't, we're going to pick up on the conclusion of last week's program. The verse I'm going to read to you is Hebrews chapter 12, 22 through 23. It's going to come on the screen. But you are come unto Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to the God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now, last week's program, we talked about the word general assembly and how it ties into the great assembly, which was organized by Ezra and Nehemiah in the Old Testament, consisting of 120 elders and prophets, and how the Jewish Knesset is 120 members based off of the ancient idea of the uh, assembly that uh, Ezra and Nehemiah assembled together. Now, let me pick up from there and share something with you that's very important. This is a Jewish teaching that there was every seven year, years a great assembly that would take place at the temple. And here's how it went. You do know from the law of Jubilees that every uh, seven years, every seventh year was a Jubilee cycle where the land rested and uh, it was a time of, of freedom from oppression. The, the silver trumpets of Jubilee would blow on the Day of Atonement on the seventh year. Day of Atonement being on the Hebrew calendar, the tenth day of the seventh month. Now, this, this celebration began on that day, and here's what happens. On the seventh year, all of the people, including the men and the women, assembled on the seventh year at the platform on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. The crowd arrived, and when the crowd finally arrived, the king of Israel would ascend what was called the bema. Now, the bema was a large platform. Once the king ascended to the bema, he handed the Torah scroll, the five books of Moses, to the synagogue president. The synagogue president then turned and handed it to the high priest. The high priest then would bless it, bless the word of God and the Torah, and pass it back to the king who received it personally and who read from the Torah scroll. This is the only occasion when gold trumpets were used. Normally, you blew, they blew a shofar, which was a ram's horn or a, the horn of an, uh, of an antelope, or they would use silver trumpets during certain feast days, especially uh, to announce the jubilee, etc. But on the seventh year, the gold trumpets were used. And remember, gold represents deity. Gold represents divinity all throughout the Scripture, especially in the Old Testament. Now, that was what happened on the seventh year, every seventh year, in Jerusalem when the temple existed, where all the people gathered together and there was what was called a great assembly, a great assembly. Now remember, Paul in Hebrews 12 talks about the general assembly, and that word again we told you last week means to gather all, to gather all together in one location, with the emphasis being on the place and the location. Now look at the parallels that we see in the book of Revelation to when the saints gather with the holy angels in heaven, the way Paul alluded to in Hebrews chapter 12. The book of Revelation is John's vision of the apocalypse, those things which were hidden. From chapter 4 to chapter 19 deals with a seven-year time frame called the tribulation. Don't have time to get into that. You that go to our summer conferences at St. Louis and Louisville, I'll be doing the entire book of Revelation at both of those conferences in St. Louis and Louisville. But here's, here's, the, here's the great assembly parallels in the book of Revelation. Number one, we see the lion of the tribe of Judah, 
with a seven-sealed book that he is going to open and read from that book. This lamb is also the king of kings and the lord of lords in Revelation 19. So there's the imagery of the king ascending the platform at the temple and preparing to read from the scroll or read from the book. In 6 and 1, he opens up the seals and the judgments are initiated as the contents are discovered of what it says. Then in chapter 7, verse 9, we see a gathering together of not only uh, people out of every tribe, nation, kindred, and tongue who've made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb, who've come out of great tribulation, and we see them in chapter 7. So we can see in chapter 4, where it says 10,000 times 10,000 are singing, Worthy is the Lamb who has redeemed us unto God. Then in chapter 7, we see a multitude coming out of tribulation. So we see... In Revelation 4 and 5, the assembly at the platform in heaven, that crystal sea of glass where God's throne is. Then in chapter 9, we see another multitude appearing there. So we see this concept of a great assembling of people out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and peoples. All in one, gathered together in one. Is that not what Paul said would happen? Both the dead and the living before the heavenly temple, before the throne of God in heaven. Now, when I talk about the coming of the Lord, especially the rapture, there are, there's three types of people that we hear from. First of all, we hear from people that are called preterists. And a preterist is an individual that believes all the prophecies relating to the Antichrist and the tribulation have already occurred, and they try to make it all fit in the year 70 A.D. They try to say that the book of Revelation was written before the destruction of the temple in the year 70, because in Revelation 11, God tells John to measure the temple of God and those who worship therein, and how the outer court would be trampled down by the Gentiles. And so, you know, the, the, the thing about it is, uh, the early fathers tell you that who the emperor, Roman emperor was at the time that John was banished to the Isle of Patmos, and that emperor died in about 95 A.D., and most scholars will tell you that the book of Revelation was written about 24 to 25 years after 70 A.D. Now, that alone destroys all preterism. The preterists don't have a leg to stand on when you prove the book of Revelation was not written in 68 A.D. the way they teach. There is another group called the Amillennialists. They believe there's no millennial reign of Christ. And, of course, when it comes to a coming of the Lord, we call it a rapture. They don't believe in that. The third group is simply a group of people who have listened to different uh, maybe television ministers or different people on satellite who have just inbred into them that the rapture is not in the Bible. And, uh, and, and, and they especially key up on this idea, and, and it's a fact that the word rapture is not mentioned and people are preaching a false doctrine because they're using the word rapture. Now, these are what I call rapture fighters, and they are multiplying by the hundreds and the thousands. In fact, what scares me is a lot of the younger pastors who are coming up in churches pastoring, who are coming out of theological seminaries, are being taught this, there is no uh, rapture, uh, mentioned in the Bible, and therefore they're not even teaching on the coming of the Lord anymore. Okay, let's first of all, let's look at this, because I'm going to spend some time right here, folks. The word rapture is not in the English translation of the Bible. Okay, why do you use the word, Brother Stone? I, can, you know, they, I get the letters. That is not even in the Bible. You're a heretic. Okay, let me ask you something. Does your pastor, or have you read a book on demons? Yes or no? Answer the question. Yes or no? The answer is yes. Do you know the word demons is not found in the English translation of the Bible anywhere? Nowhere. No. Have you ever heard anybody talk about the second coming of Christ? The, the phrase second coming? Have you? You know what? The phrase second coming is found nowhere in the Bible. Why do we use it? Is a person a heretic because they teach the second coming? Is a person a heretic because they teach on demons? What about the word millennial reign? Now, I can take you to Revelation chapter 20 and show you six places that the word 1,000 years is mentioned. So, is a person a heretic for saying millennial reign, but not a heretic for saying 1,000 years? Okay? This is called straining at a net and swallowing a camel, because a millennium is 1,000 years. So, it's a Latin word used to describe 1,000 years. We use the word decade and century to describe time frames. Let's go back to the word demons. Where does the word come from? From the Greek word possessed. The Greek word possessed, you hear the word demon 